Hello, welcome to Van Diemen's Land Model Bench. I'm Dan, and to the second part of our build of the Academy 135th scale German T3476 747. When I left you in the last video, I was just starting assembly of the upper hull, so just to give you a quick recap on that and what my experience was in building the rest of the kit. So that's basically, I was up to step six when I was starting to put the detail here on the uh, upper hull. I also had to drill out some holes at the back here in step five because I was going to be fitting the alternative fuel tanks which were the German style fuel tanks on the back of the tank so you need to drill a couple of holes for that on each side. Um, that all went fine though, all the parts went well. Um, I left off the uh, saw because I was going to paint that later. And yeah, I think everything else went fine. I left the light off because that wasn't fitted to the particular variant that I was doing. although. It is shown on the illustration on the painting, which is uh, the painting on the front box, which is interesting, but it's actually not uh, indicating the instructions that should be there. Then on step seven, uh, we sort of finish off the back deck. So we put on the photo etch part that we've done earlier, if you've decided to go with that. Had a few interesting times with the photo etch too. Um, it just wouldn't stick down. Now, I, I haven't had a lot of experience with photo etch. I, my main experience with it is doing a uh, kit that I'm building at the moment, which is a Mitchell 109 instrument panel from Eddard, which has got a ton of photo etch in it. And, and it all went perfectly on that kit, but for some reason with the Academy one, I just couldn't get these parts to stick down properly. I tried CA glue, and I tried my other favourite glue for this sort of work now, which is the GS Hypo Cement, but sometimes these little bits would stick up again. I'm not sure what it was, so... I don't know if I was supposed to clean them first or there's some sort of preparation I should have done. So if you've had more experience with photo etch and you've got some ideas maybe what I did wrong there, I'd really appreciate your comments uh, below the video just to let me know and everyone else know what I should have done. But in the end, I battled on and I did get it all to fit so well enough, so I did use that. That all went together fine. Um, I didn't put the front track on my kit because the was a, a comment posted on the kit maker network i'm also blogging this uh, build because this kit was courtesy of the kit maker network so i'm i'm blogging the build over there and uh one of the commentators on there just mentioned that this was most probably an after war adaption to the t34 putting the track on the front and indeed when i had a look at any of the photos i could find online of the t34s in german service i didn't find any with the track on the front so that meant I had to fill in a couple of very small holes that were there for mounting that piece uh, on the front. And that was actually only one of two places I had to use any filler at all on this kit, which was really good. Down towards the bottom here is the step that I did, step nine, where I had to fit the uh, German style fuel tanks on the back. They look really fragile, but actually if they get, once you glue them on, they, they sit there very well. So there was no dramas there. Of course, I had to test this out because this was the exact time I decided to drop the model off my workbench broke both of those off from one of the railings but fortunately I didn't do too much damage and I was able to reassemble it all without any problem. Also on this step they recommend you put G5 and G6 which is the rear sort of uh, guards on the back of the tank which I did do and later found out that probably wasn't the best idea so if you're doing this kit I recommend you don't put G5 and G6 on in step 9. You put them on a little bit later in the build and I'll talk about that when we get there. In step 10, uh, the focus then changes to the turret and that all went together extremely well. There's no problem at all. You do get a couple of different options depending on which version of the tank you're going to build. Um, this was only the second place where I had to use a little bit of filler and it was a tiny amount. I mean a very tiny amount. Just at the front of the gun here, uh, this piece here, once you've assembled, uh, where is it, E2 and E3, there was a slight gap just at the back which I used a little bit of putty on. Uh, the putty I used for both that and the earlier part, part where there was the holes for the track was some Vallejo plastic putty. Uh, this is a water soluble uh, putty. Absolutely fantastic for those little tiny jobs. You just basically dab a little bit on. It comes with a, like a needle applicator, such as very handy. Dab a little bit on and I just used a, uh, I think it was a, an earbud, like a cotton bud and dipped it a little bit of water so it was moist and then I just wiped it over the top of the 
plastic putty and smoothed it out. It didn't require any sanding at all. So really handy for those little jobs. Other than that, all the turret went together beautifully. There was no fit issues, everything worked the way it should. When we get to step 11, you have to put on the uh, grab rails if, if it's applicable to the version you're building, which it was in my case. And that's where I noticed that while I had this bracket on the back for the grab rail, I had nothing really to work with to align the two side ones, M19. And that's when I noticed inside the tank, there is actually indentations where it looks like these handles would be. So what I did was just use a pin vise drill and drill those holes out. So I knew where these grab handles would have to go. Uh, because the angle I had to put the vise at, I didn't quite line them up properly. So I had to put a little bit of filler around one of the holes, but you yeah. know, not a problem, but it would have been nice to know that I had to drill those out a bit earlier. It wouldn't honestly have made it any easier, but just to know that's what I was supposed to do. Um, this step here is interesting because you've got three alternatives and really it's all the same thing. Each one of these is just simply saying add the barrel. It's just showing you the alternate style turrets that you can build out of the kit. Uh, but it still gives you a good idea of what it looked like if you decide later you want to build one of the other variants. In step 12 is the driver's hatch, that all went fine. Step 13, which is the tow ropes, I haven't done those yet, I gave, I skipped those, so I have to come back and do those separately. Uh, step 14 is the major assembly of the three sub-components, if you like, the turret upper hull and lower hull. And this is where I had one of the fit issues, which was to do with those rear guards I was mentioning a bit earlier. They've got a slight lip underneath them and the idea is that basically the lower hull piece will then sort of slide in that little lip and lock in and then you sort of bring the rest down and glue it. And it didn't quite fit because I didn't quite have those guards right. I'm sure if I'd lined them up properly, if I knew that's where I was going with the kit, um, it probably would have worked. But it didn't fit properly so what I had to do was break off those rear guards. Uh, glue the two pieces together, the upper and lower hull, and then reattach the guards. And I found that, anyway, to be a lot easier process to do it that way. So that's what I was saying before about holding off. I would say in step 14 is when you should look at uh, uh, fitting the rear guards. In step 15, for example, the Academy even says put the front guards on. I don't know why they just didn't say in step 15 put the front and the rear guards on. The only reason I can think they didn't was because they thought it might be a bit hard to get to them with the fuel tanks over the top of them but I found that not to be a problem at all. If you watched my earlier video, you would have seen that I originally was going to have the front driver's hatch fully open, and, and indeed I did a test fit that way, but what I found was the, um, you know, there's no detail at all in the kit, and it just, it's too big an opening, it just didn't look right, so I ended up deciding to model this in the closed position and button it up, so that was just a choice I made because there's no detail inside the sea. But really, the rest of the assembly went together remarkably well. I used Tamiya Extra Thin Cement for all the gluing. Uh, I think I used a little bit of um, Revel Cement. Well, I can find their one. I've got one here somewhere. Uh, no, maybe I can't. Oh, here we go. I used a little bit of Revel's um, Contactor Professional for just gluing the upper and lower hull bits because this dries a little bit slower. So I use that to get the initial bite to hold those parts together. And then just around the seams, I ran a little bit of um, Tamiya's Extra Thin just to be on the safe side. So I don't think the tank kit's coming apart anytime soon. Then it was ready for priming. And for priming, I had used what I've been using throughout the build. I used some of um, Ammo by MIG's gray primer and hit a snag. I put this on and it reacted in some places on the kit so i started getting like a i don't know what you call it a bit like a little bit of a bubbling to the surface i'm not sure whether i had a contaminant in my airbrush maybe i had a little bit of airbrush cleaner left over and that reacted or whether there was something on the on the actual plastic of the academy kit or maybe this has just got a use by date maybe this is just getting a little bit old and not working as well as it did i don't know i honestly don't know but what i do know was it didn't go on as smoothly as it normally has. And I have used this on two or three other projects without any dramas. So I was a little bit surprised by that. I was a bit impatient to get the primer on the model. So I did a stupid thing. I just kept spraying. I should have stopped at that point and then just sort of tried to figure out what had gone wrong, but I kept going. So I had that problem in a couple of spots on the tank or three in, in total. And I put on the primer far thicker than I normally would because I was you know, trying to cover up the mistake. 
and uh, that was a silly thing to do but I was impatient and once it was done it was done the good news was was the primer actually self leveled um, very well so a lot of the places where I was expecting to have to sand it back I didn't really need to in the places that were affected by the bubbling I was able just to sand it lightly and it smoothed it out and it seemed to be fine so I didn't bother putting any more primer on I left it at that point and then we came to painting the primary color which is of course is the yellow and if you recall in the first video I said I was going to give a go with the life color paints which I did so let's um, have a look at the model As you can see there now I'm under LED lighting here at the moment I haven't got a lot of natural light in this room so I'll put up a couple of photos of the tank in natural light so you can get a bit hopefully a bit more of an appreciation uh, this is my first go at doing the modulation and like the primer I had a few issues going through this was not a particularly fun uh, spray job in the booth uh, trying to get this all working so first of all uh, the paints I did use all three of them uh, as I anticipated I would but while I was painting the model and I started off with the uh, actually went the reverse of what I was going to do I didn't start with the the deep shade I actually started with the ground shade which is kind of like the I guess the overall tank color if you're just painting it in, in one shade I painted that first over most of the model and then I went back over and put some dark shadow colors in different places and then I added the flash shade which is the highlights in some places as well and that all would have been good but of course uh, in the middle of trying to learn how to use life color paints and figure out how to work well my little HP uh, sorry my little Iwata HP airbrush which has been fantastic decided to start playing up and the valve was sticking and it wasn't spraying at all well um, and it's still got, actually I've still got to pull it apart again and keep working on it because it's still not working 100% I'm not quite sure why it decided this particular project it wanted to do this but it did and so as a result I ended up actually flooding a couple of spots while I was trying to fiddle around with this airbrush and get it to work properly and I was absolutely convinced that I was going to have to go back and sand those parts down again and repaint it so I was quite annoyed about it um, but to my surprise and and delight uh, actually the life color paints leveled out even in those locations where I put way too much paint because I was filling around with this airbrush and it settled right down I can tell you one of the spots was right here and you won't see it. it's just it's just not visible anymore but if you've ever had that experience with an airbrush where you've uh, maybe had dry tip and then suddenly the paint started flying normally again and you sort of flooded a spot on your model you know what I'm talking about um, that's what happened with the paint and it fixed itself so I was really impressed and given that I was having to change airbrushes in the middle of this paint job and all the other dramas I was having um, I was quite pleased with the overall finish so thoughts on the life color paints um, initially I tried about a 50 50 mix of paint to thinner so I was using uh, life colors own thinner brand with it and that went fine I used one or two drops as well just for an experiment of you find it here just for an experiment I tried one or two drops of flow aid as well not sure if that was even necessary to be perfectly honest it didn't hurt but I don't know if it really helped um, what I found with the 50 50 mix was the paint was extremely thin so you would need to put it on two or three coats not that I'm saying that's a problem but just to be aware of it so um, halfway through doing the models I said I had problems with the airbrush so I switched airbrushes and went across to my old patch Talon airbrush which I just recently got back into service um, it's a bit of a I don't know what you call it the Cadillac of airbrushes it's a very rugged airbrush but it works um, so I started using that's a dual action one started using that and decided to try a slightly different uh, mix of paint so I went with 70% paint 30% thinner and got the coverage I wanted so I, had, I didn't have to paint as many coats on and was initially a little bit concerned about how it would dry but actually it again dried extremely well so what I've learned so far with the life color paints is if you're just doing a single color and you you know you want to not have to spend all day spray painting it probably 70 30 or a 60 40 mix would be where I would start you may still have to put two coats on 
but this paint dries very quickly anyway, so you won't be too long. Um, the good thing about the 50-50 mix though, is if you want to blend your colours, which I did do a little bit here, I tried to do a little bit of basic sort of modulation, uh, the 50-50 mix is fantastic because it just sort of basically acts like a filter. It doesn't completely cover the under uh, the underpinning colour on your model, so you can sort of blend the colours in a bit. So that would be great, particularly if you've only got a very basic airbrush. You could you could you know use these paints, I think, and successfully blend colours uh, using a single action airbrush, where most people would assume you've used a dual action airbrush to get that effect, because they, you know, they as I said, they thin quite a lot, and uh, you can sort of coat them out of the top to get different effects. So overall, the life color worked pretty well. Uh, the overall impression I get of them, uh, if I just put, say, a Tamiya and a Mr. Hobby here. So here's Tamiya and Mr. Hobby. I think personally, these are probably two of the most foolproof brands of paint you can get on the market. These are so forgiving. You can mix, you can spray them directly on the models. You can mix them, you know, any ratio up to about a 50-50, even, 40% paint, 60% thinner, and most of the time it won't make the slightest difference. The paint will go on just the same as it always does, and you'll have no dramas. If you're someone who's got used to painting like that, if you like these paints and you got used to painting like that, then probably the life color paint is going to be a little bit of a challenge for you because it is fussier about the thinner. There's no question about that. Uh, if you vary from, as I said, 30% to 50%, you see the paint will still work, but the paint acts differently. It starts to get a different sort of characteristic about it. It goes from being a paint that you could be using more to paint a primary colour uh, at 70% at paint to a 50% mix where it's looking more like it's, it's acting a little bit more like a filter. You can still paint your whole model in 50%. You just going to have to put two or three light coats on it, whereas you might have got away with just one coat on the Tamiya or the Mr. Hobby. So I don't think it's a bad thing, but it is. Uh, it just behaves a little bit differently. So if you're used to the Tamiya Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Hobby type paints and the Aquas Hobby color paints, and you know you like the ease of use, and you want to have a go at live color, just be aware that you're going to have to put a little bit more thought into it. Other than that, I really like the uh, finish that they gave. They have they give an extremely flat matte finish on the model. That is absolutely flat. It dries very, very um, smooth as well. I cannot um, get any fault at all with the life color paints in that respect. They do self-level beautifully. So if you want a really nice flat finish and you've got a model that's got a lot of detail on it, uh, I'd be using life color. If you, uh, another example where I'd probably use them would be um, ship builds, where you've got a lot of very fine photo etched parts and very fine plastic parts, and you don't want to sort of obscure that detail with lots of paint. I would be you know, looking at the life color ones, setting them down to about 60, 40 or 50, 50 and putting two or three light coats of that on and you would be sure that all the detail that you've gone on that trouble of building would still be uh, still be there and still be visible. Um, so they do, they do work very well. Airbrush cleaning was fine. No problems of getting them to, uh, to clean out my airbrush with them. So overall, they're pretty good. I, I just don't think they're quite as easy as these ones. So you'll have to make your decision whether you think there's something you want to have a try. I'm going to have another video probably where I'm going to give you some thoughts on my paints because I've used enough paints now that I'm starting to sort of form an opinion about what's going to make up the bulk of my uh, paint rack in the future as I start running out of paints and replacing them. So I'll do a future video on that. But so far, pretty positive. With the uh, rails and things like this, I brush painted those after the event with uh, some of the light flashed colour, just using a brush. I actually used a bit of the the uh, paint that was left over in my from mixing my uh, paint for the airbrush, it all went on fine. And as you'll see in a video, I just put on there just to show you this other advantage the life color does have. And this is this is definitely one of its strengths. Definitely over say the Tamiya is if you are someone who uses uh, paint brushes on your kits, you should be definitely having a look at life color and giving it a go. This self leveling ability that it's got is fantastic. And uh, even if you brush paint, it doesn't show any uh, sort of brush strokes or streaks or anything like that behind. Uh, you may have to put two or three coats on again, but it's going to go on very level and very smooth. So if you uh, like to do a lot of work with brushes, definitely Live Color is a brand you should be checking out. You'll see in that photo, I wasn't particularly careful about applying the paint 
onto it. I wanted to just sort of slop it on a bit really and just see what happened. And as you can see in the after photo, uh, it dried really smooth. So yeah, there's definitely some pluses there with the life colors, even if you've got to work a little bit harder with them when it comes to spray painting. Overall though, pretty happy with the modulation effect. So at this point, the model's ready to um, have the stripes put on it, which I'm a bit nervous about because uh, they're, they're quite clear. So what I'm thinking I'm going to do, when I say they're quite clear, they're very obvious, they're thin lines over it. So what I'm going to do is actually put some pencil marks on the model first because one thing the instructions don't do a terrific job of is explaining the pattern. So here's the picture here. And as you can see, you get a side profile and a little bit of the turret, but nothing of the top deck. So I've been online trying to find some some sort of a paint guide that gives me an idea of what it should look like on the top deck. And I really couldn't find anything. Eventually, what I stumbled across was actually some press photos that Academy took of the built kit. And they actually built it, fortunately for me, using this colour scheme. So I was able to get some views from that of the top deck to see what it looks like. So because I'm not terribly confident with an airbrush when it comes to painting something like this, what I've decided to do is I'm just going to very lightly pencil on in uh, the green and brown colour pencils where the camouflage should be, so I don't have to think about that while I'm spray painting it. I can just look at the pencil lines and know exactly where I've got to uh, put the paint. And hopefully that means I can just focus on the airbrush side of things and not worrying about trying to look at the diagrams and the pictures and translate all that at the same time as work the airbrush. So that's what I'll be doing next, and then we'll uh, we'll put the clear coat on and keep going with it. So that's all coming in part three. So that's where we're up to with the T34. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next part.